Doug, who I'd like to maybe have you chat a little bit about what you've seen. You know, uh, you support a lot of organizations in how they run their operations from a finance perspective. What's your perspective on, on what you see in the market? The risks are very different when, in, when you're in a global environment. Uh, from as simple things like compliance to more complicated about currency movements, things like that, or, or war, because we are, I don't, I don't think we have been at so many wars at the same time ever as we have in the last few years. Um, and, and uh, uh, you know, refugee crisis, things like that, that you're not thinking about how does it affect the Levi's business. And I actually don't know how it affects the Levi's business personally, but that may have an impact because there is a big flow of refugees and maybe the Germans are, aren't spending as much money on clothing because they're giving a little bit more towards supporting the refugees or something like that. So you, you, you see different impacts of different things that are happening halfway across the world impacting your business. And, and um, you gotta be very mindful of those because if you're not watching out, you could, your business could suffer. And this is all about uh, looking out a lot more than just looking back, even though where you're coming from is extremely important. That when a world level event uh, occurs, it actually impacts our markets and impacts the way we think about our business going forward. A very simple example is when there is a flight to quality in the, uh, in the bond market across the world, when there's a problem in Greece, when Brexit happens, you know, interest rates drop here. Uh, the Treasury curve you know, drops, and that impacts what we view as our future business, what we project for revenues. So even if you are a local, local uh, organization with local customers, the world and what happens in the world impacts you almost instantaneously. looking at older companies who are very based in on-premise software and going to SaaS, going to the cloud. In many cases, you get a nice ROI that's done for you with very optimistic claims from the system side. And in your CFO role, you try and make this realistic and get to it. And so say it's going to pay back in three years. Great. Three years payback seems to make sense. But what you don't realize is a couple of things. One is you're getting yourself tied to the SaaS provider. In other words, you've gone through a lot of integrations to get it to work with your system, get rid of your on-prem. And over those three years, there's going to be upgrades. There's going to be a change in the name. And another big risk is it's going to be bought out. If it's a great small platform, it's going to get bought out by one of those large companies here in Silicon Valley that's going to change the name, bundle it with everything else. As you know, the bundling happens. And you say to yourself, does the three years pay? It's hard to do it. It's hard to do a post audit. But that's one side. The other side is your people side. Because, it, yeah, you're going to have greater sales. It's going to give them the information they need to cut costs. But in some cases, some of these applications aren't the most important to me. And people just have a certain capacity for time and effort. So the fact that I am forced to leave a lot of on-prem devices that aren't the most important thing to my cash flow. That's kind of one of the risks I see, and that's kind of one of the jobs of being a good CFO, to understand what you can believe and what you can't, because systems don't work by themselves. A great example of brand management is the Yahoo um, hacking scandal that came out, where Verizon might not buy them. I mean, imagine that. You know, your, your value went from whatever four billion to, let's just call it zero, from one perspective. And that can be so detrimental to your health, even though they may not have lost any customers. I still have a Yahoo account, but it's used for junk mail, so who cares? But if you are using Yahoo or something like that for, for your basic business, you may actually have to think about, do you really want to do business with Yahoo or not? And those are things that, good or bad times, have a much more impact on your business. I look at it from a, a couple different perspectives. One, it's how do you protect your brand? 
And what we're seeing more and more is that there's certain large players out there, Amazon, for example, who's saying that there's a, they're, only, they're not going to be an editor of what's online. They're just going to provide the service. Whereas, whereas what that creates for brands who want to protect their brand is how do you prevent all the diverters from ruining your brand? In other words, someone who's buying, a, like in the case of uh, Levi Seconds or any type of other product, or somebody who's buying product online at a discount and reselling, and you realize from a CFO role that there's a bigger cost to this because someone comes in with a box of chocolates and says this is old because they got it through a diverter who had it sitting on their shelf for six months. You have to protect your brand. So we have the, the number of cease and desist letters we've done in the past year is higher than you've ever imagined. And protecting the brand and that brand risk and protecting your brand name is becoming a much larger part of the risk profile that we're facing. From the cyber protection side, there's one story, Geico, which is a subsidiary of Berkshire, they did their own internal phishing expedition. They developed in-house um, an email, and I get a lot of them myself, that our phishing emails invoice you owe, the CEO says to pay so and so. Well, they created a nice little email that they sent out to the company across not only finance, but marketing and other areas, and 77% of the people opened up the reply that could have caused malware, ransomware, et cetera. So you're saying, how can that be? And so all the subsidiaries, we're all doing the same thing. You put out your own one, your IT creates this, and yeah, they have to call service and get their, their uh, be reset, but they do it again, and there's still 50% of the people. They do it again, it's still 40% of the people. So part of the mindset to protecting the brand is to realize it's not just the brand name, but protecting your assets. And so we've got to evolve with doing these types of things to teach people who are just trying to get their job done. It says I owe them, I'm clicking on that. And so there's little things that we need to organize and we need to tell people and reward people who find these things. And so now what we do is if someone comes up with a good phishing scheme that they didn't open but they sent to IT, we'll put out a little company thing that says, Thank you to so-and-so so for being so diligent. Here's an example. Well, from my, from my perspective, the entrepreneurial spirit is something that keeps companies alive and keeps them growing. Obviously, having a good established brand helps, but if others can eat into your brand or into your market, that can really negatively impact you. And, and just as an example, last year one of our large customers came to us and said, hey, we need to solve for this. Can you go do, a, do some research and tell us what are the options, uh, uh, what solutions are out there to solve for this problem? We went out, we did a bunch of research for them, uh, essentially did an RFP process, uh, find out, found out that really there wasn't a good solution out there. So when we were presenting our findings to the client, we actually added a fourth column of an option uh, that basically said global upside. Mm -hmm. And uh, the client started laughing at us, like, what the hell are you doing? You're putting yourself into a bucket that you have never been in. We're not a software company, we're a services company. And we said, yeah, we don't know a good solution, so we think we can go build it for you if you're willing to buy it from us. And they said, OK, we'll give you some period of time to build it and prove to us that you can do it. Today, we have a solution that we built in less than two months that the client bought off on. Basically, started with Slideware. Obviously, somebody was willing to take a risk and with the right support to say, yes, we can do it. Mm -hmm. And then you do it, and you end up with a paying customer. And we're, as we have started to market that, we're finding out that this is a great solution. And it came about because of a need from a client, not because some people set it around a, in a strategic planning session or something and said, oh, we should find this solution cure. Because there's obviously lots of challenges that are out there in the world. Not everything is being worked on or solved. And not everybody can do it. But you have to take a stand and you have to take some risk. Well, from a risk perspective, I always think it's a dynamic environment yeah. because the risks that we were facing 
as a company ourselves or as a country or as a geography, however you want to think about it, yesterday may not be the same tomorrow. And, and um, lots and lots of things can impact risk and the future of your company. So you have to be very intelligent, talk to a lot of people, read up a lot, and assess the world events, the things that are impacting your business, uh, the cost of cocoa, as an example, uh, you know, what's happening to that, uh, that will cause you pain points or advantages in the future because if you control a big piece of some market, that has an advantage that may have a disadvantage to you because somebody else is going to come after it, especially in the technology environment. There's always somebody who's trying to come up with a better mousetrap. So how are you going to control that market share and not let some new startup erode it. So it's a dynamic environment. Stay focused, stay on guard, watch out, because tomorrow you could face something brand new that you have never seen before. It helps to even just disrupt the process. So rather than we go through our same strategic planning muscle every year that we're really good at planning three years out, and you know, having some way to just make the process itself feel different, because it tends to just jar people themselves out of kind of conventional ways of thinking, whether that's an outside speaker, a, a new location, um, just a, a change to, to, to the way you do the work uh, often, often lets you see kind of these, these risks in a different way too. When I think about risk, one of the things I think about is barriers to entry. And I think about all of us that face the same thing, building a better mousetrap, how other people are going to get better quality labor, or from the sales standpoint, or from the, the clothing manufacturing, and I look at barriers to entry and how do we protect those? How do we protect what's core to our business? And then thinking a little bit differently, for example, craft coffees, then it became craft beers, and now it's becoming craft chocolate, which affects me. So I've got to think ahead of time to some of these things and what do you have to defend against that? And acquiring that business, you know, like has happened in the beer, industry is one way to do it, but how do you protect what you have and make it very difficult for them to take that next step up and you have that barrier to entry to what you're going to protect. So that's what I look at when I think about the risk and for each of our businesses, how you protect that. Great. Well, I wanted to thank our panelists today for, uh, for taking time out of their busy schedule to, to chat uh, and to talk. And, uh, and thank you everybody for taking the time to listen to us today. Thank you.